Hello, welcome to Breakthrough from Science Mission. I'm Sadashiva Pai and going to discuss couple of breakthrough papers published in the week of May 5th. First we are going to discuss a paper published by Dennis from Dr. Rameshberg's lab in Nature. The paper talks about the use of unnatural amino acids for the replication of DNA in E. coli and growth of the cells with the new DNA. Unnatural base pairs used in the study are structurally compared with the deoxycytosine and deoxyguanine as shown in this figure. The authors tested their stability and uptake from the culture media containing growing E. coli overexpressed with a nucleotide triphosphate transporters which the authors previously shown to work better in transporting triphosphates into the cells. After optimizing assay conditions, authors show that unnatural phosphates, especially triphosphates, are stable in the media and are taken up by the cells. Although authors observed both extra and intracellular dephosphorylation, the ratio of triphosphate to dephosphorylation products inside the cell remained roughly constant, indicating the extracellular concentrations and tri transporter mediated influx are sufficient to compensate for intracellular decomposition. Also, the intracellular concentrations of intact triphosphates are significantly above the submicromolar values of the unnatural triphosphates required by polymerases for replication. Next, authors looked at if unnatural base pairs are incorporated during replication. To determine whether E. coli can use the imported unnatural triphosphate to stably propagate E. coli cells, they were first transformed with the plasmid encoding transporter and grown in media containing unnatural triphosphates and 1 millimolar IPTG to induce transporter production. Cells were then transformed with a plasmid called INF in which DADT pair at position 505 replaced with unnatural amino acids. Cell growth was monitored via culture turbidity. As shown in this figure, growth was significantly slower in the presence of IPTG, but addition of unusual base pairs resulted in only a slight further decrease in growth initially and the lag was eliminated at the later stage about 18 hours of cell growth. To determine the level of unnatural base pair retention, plasmid was recovered, digested and dephosphorylated to single nucleosides and analyzed by LCMS. A clear signal of unnatural amino acid was observed in the mass spectra. To independently confirm and quantify the retention of unnatural base pair in the recovered plasmid, the relevant region was amplified by PCR in the presence of unnatural amino acid triphosphate and biotinylated analog as shown in this figure. Analysis by streptavidin gel shift showed that 67% of the amplified DNA contained biotin. No shift was observed in control experiments. When the amplification product obtained with unnatural amino acid was analyzed by Sanger sequencing in the presence of unnatural triphosphates, the sequencing chromatogram showed a complete termination at the position of unnatural base pair incorporation. In contrast, amplification products obtained from controls propagated under identical conditions showed no termination. These experiments confirm the incorporation of unnatural base pair in the plasmid during replication. Authors looked at unnatural base pair stability inside the cells. Since unnatural base pair was retained over 15 hour period of growth indicating that it is not efficiently excised by DNA repair pathways. To test further this hypothesis and to examine the retention during prolonged stationary phase growth, authors repeated experiments but monitored unnatural base pair retention, cell growth 
and unnatural triphosphate decomposition for up to six days without providing any additional unnatural phosph triphosphates as shown in this figure. At 15 and 19 hour of glow, the cultures reached an optical density at 600 nanometer of approximately 0.9 and 1.2 respectively. And both unnatural triphosphates decomposed to 17 to 20 percent and 10 to 16 percent of their initial concentration. Retention of unnatural base pair after 15 hour was 97 percent and 95 percent as determined by gel shift and sequencing respectively and after 19 hour it was 91 percent and 95 percent. As the culture center stationary phase and the triphosphate decomposed completely plasmid loss began to compete with replication but even then retention of unnatural base pair remained at approximately 45 and 15 percent at days 3 and 6 respectively. Moreover, when unnatural amino acid was lost, it was replaced by DADT, the shape of the retention versus curve mirrors that of growth versus time curve. Taken together, these data suggest in the absence of unnatural triphosphate, the unnatural base pair is eventually lost by replication mediated mispairing and not from the activity of DNA repair pathways. So the authors were able to grow the cells with unnatural base pairs for the first time and it is a big breakthrough in the field. Now let's look at another paper published by Nawazish and Ming from Dr. Hussein's lab. Contrary to the earlier notion, this paper demonstrates that cardiomyocytes retain proliferative capability at early neonatal stage. Let's see what is known about cardiomyocyte differentiation. Cardiomyocytes terminally differentiate by postnatal day 5 in mouse. Extensive binucleation of cardiomyocytes happen between P5 to P10 considered terminal differentiation marker. By P7 heart slows regenerative capability. During early preadolescence that is P5 to P14 the expression of genes responsible for cell cycle entry mitosis and cytokinesis falls precipitously. Between P10 and P21, that is the weaning period, estimates of S phase indicate that cardiomyocytes are quiescent. Cardiomyocytes added to post neonatal hearts at a rate of 0.76% per year. Only 0.2% of mononuclear cardiomyocytes retain proliferative capacity. This indicates that there wasn't much growth of cardiomyocytes in the early stages. Authors evaluated total cardiomyocyte number that is CPN in ventricular myocardium by enzymatic disaggregation and direct cell counting. Estimates of total cardiomyocyte numbers identify two distinct increases in CPN. A 40% increase between P1 and P4 and a further 40% further 40% increase between P14 and P18. A total of 22% of post P14 CPN increase occurred by 4 p.m. on P15, that is P15A, with no further change between P18 and P325. To determine the time of onset of mitosis, authors measured the expression of several mitosis promoting genes in cardiac ventricles daily from P13 to P16. What did they find? They found 5 to 12 fold increases in mRNA levels of all these genes on the morning of P15, with the levels on P15 falling to near P13 levels. Thus, cardiomyocytes are M phase as early as 9 a.m. on P15. Authors found extensive proliferation in P-adolescent heart. 
transverse section of ventricle of mice sacrificed between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. revealed a 36-fold increase in left ventricle cardiomyocyte mitosis between P14 and P15, followed by an abrupt 5.8-fold decrease between P15 and P16. These changes parallel changes in expression of mitosis promoting genes as shown previously. Nuclear localization in Aurora B in most of the mitotic cardiomyocytes indicated that these cells were in prophase. Mitotic cardiomyocyte nuclear were not uniformly distributed throughout left ventricular wall being 2.fold more abundant in subendocardial than subepicardial myofibers of the P15 left ventricle. Approximately 10% of the total mitotic P15 cardiomyocytes were mononuclear and 90% were binuclear. Authors calculated the number of mono, bi and multinuclear cardiomyocytes added to the ventricles between morning of P14 and afternoon of P15 by multiplying average CPN by the percentages of cardiomyocytes that were mononucleate binucleate or multinucleate at these times. The most striking change was 1.93 fold increase in mononuclear cardiomyocytes. Binuclear cells went down by 15 percent and multinuclear cells went up by 1.5 fold. There was decrease in volume size of the mono binuclear cells by 45 percent and 60 percent respectively. Authors determined that this increase in burst of cells is primarily by splitting of mononuclear cells and binuclear cells as demonstrated in this schematic. Wherein binuclear cells without undergoing cytokinesis become multinuclear cells and with cytokinesis give rise to mononuclear and binuclear cells but cell volume goes down. Similarly, mononuclear cells split and become smaller mononuclear cells and also some binuclear cells which are small in size. Immediately after P10, the rate of heart growth exceeded that of body growth resulting in a rapid 30% increase in heart to body weight ratio between P10 and P15, P17. In addition, ventricular alpha-beta MHC mRNA ratio also increased 5-fold and alpha MHC levels increased 2.5-fold while atrial natriuretic factor mRNA levels, a marker for pathological hypertrophy, was not significantly increased. This molecular and morphological signature suggest a thyroid hormone-mediated effect since neither physiological nor pathological cardiac hypertrophy causes large increases in the alpha, beta, MHC, mRNA ratio. Consistent with this hypothesis, serum T3 levels increased 5.6 fold between P10 and P12. To determine if T3 is necessary for the post P10 cardiac growth, authors inhibited T3 biosynthesis by propyl thiouracil, that is PTU. PTU administration from P7 decreased serum T3 levels at P14 by 43%, prevented the increase in alpha-beta MHC mRNA ratio and reduced heart weight more than body weight, so that P14 to P18, the heart to body weight ratio of PTU treated mice were not significantly different from P10 mice. This is consistent with the high levels of circulating T3 regulating cardiac growth during the early preadolescence. The subsequent decrease in heart to body ratio between P16 and P21 was due to reduced rate of heart growth during which body weight 
continued to rise but not due to reduction in serum T3 which remained high between P12 and puberty. These findings suggest between P10 and P14 T3 is critically modulates the mode of by which body weight to circulatory volume drives heart growth allowing a more rapid increase in heart size during early pre-adolescence. AKT pathway in heart is both survival and proliferative. IGF-1 is mainly secreted by cardiac fibroblast. AKT is required for physiological growth in response to IGF-1 stimulation. T3 regulates IGF-1 mRNA in osteoblasts via IGF-1 thyroid hormone responsive element. IGF-1 causes fetal heart cardiomyocyte proliferation by activating IGF-1 receptor P13K AKT pathway. Authors found that IGF-1 mRNA and IGF-1 expression are increased 2.3 fold and 39 fold respectively in P15 relative to P10 hearts. Activation of IGF-1 receptor requires phosphorylation that activates phosphoinositol AKT. PTU suppressed the ratios, both the ratios indicating the involvement of T3 in activating IGF-1 AKT pathway in P15 ventricles. In cardiomyocytes, nuclear localization of AKT is functionally important for the proliferation. AKT was mostly localized in cardiomyocyte nuclei in P15 hearts, while in P13 hearts, its localization was cytoplasmic. These findings support a role for T3 in triggering P15 cardiomyocyte hyperplastic burst. Previously, extensive cardiac regeneration after injury leading to restoration of the ventricular wall without scar formation is observed in P1 but not P7 or P14 mice. Authors postulated that cardiomyocyte proliferation at P15 might allow cardiac regeneration. They evaluated the hypothesis by subjecting mice to cardiomyocardial infarction and comparing these response to those of P2 and P21 animals. There's, there was virtual absence of scar tissue in P12 myocardial infraction mice at P7 and 21 days post infarction, that is DPI, compared to mice at P15 as shown in this figure. Authors then compared infract sizes. No significant differences in infract sizes at P at one DPI. P21 infract sizes were 6.8 fold greater at P7 DPI than P2 infract sizes, while infract size was intermediate in P15 hearts. BRDU and alpha MHC myocardial in remote non ischemic border zones of P2, P15, and P21 hearts at 7 dpi showed fewer cells with the evidence of DNA synthesis in P15 hearts compared to P2 hearts and the absence of such cells in P21 hearts. Thus in murine hearts the capacity of cardiac regeneration after P15 is intermediate between that at P12 and at P21. Taken together this publication provides compelling evidence for the retention of cardiomyocyte proliferative competence long after neonatal period, which requires a significant revision of generally accepted view that cardiomyocytes terminally differentiate. Thank you for watching Breakthroughs in, from Science Mission.